Hey everyone, meet the Ancient One, a 50 million polygon character imagined by Aaron Sims Creative for our latest Unreal Engine 5 demo, Valley of the Ancient. With a reputation for creating incredible creatures, learn more about the Ancient One's development and how ASC pushed the animation tools to the limits, animating them entirely in Engine. And for the educators in the audience, we've created a brand new guide to help you learn everything you want to know about Unreal Engine 5 Early Access, including when to start incorporating it into your classroom. Download the guide via the feed today. Sweden-based studio Experiment 101's first title, Biomutant, takes a unique approach to the post-apocalyptic genre, creating a weird but in a good way action RPG. Discover more about the relatively small team's experience as a new studio shipping their first game and how they developed such a massive world. And now over to this week's top karma earners, many thanks to Every Nun, CTN Dev, Clockwork Ocean, Mighty Enigma, Crew Dimer, Lizard89, Lozier Yan, Mahokyo, Jackie, and Zeggy Assets. In our first spotlight, master physics defying magic in Cypher Creations Action Puzzler Strawheart. Go on a quest to start a brand new cult and resurrect an ancient evil in the realm of Acre. Wishless Strawheart on Steep. Once you've finished taking over the world, grab a snack in this lovely kitchen created by Justin Yeager. Built to experiment with UE5 and Lumen, they've leveraged Twixel Mega Scans in addition to their own models. Head over to Justin's Art Station page to see even more of their work. Set Sail in the Black Swan, a short film by Gian Pietro Fabre inspired by their work with Oslo-based production company Bacon and Master and Commander. Watch the full short and see more of Gian Pietro's work on their ArtStation page. Thanks for watching this week's news and Community Spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and today I would like to introduce once again, thank you for ha for being here, Chance Ivy, Senior yeah, Technical Product Designer. Glad to be back, thanks for having me Victor, excited. Awesome, and we are going to talk about new world building features today and to help us in this endeavor we invited Jean-Francois Dubay, welcome to the show, uh, Principal Hi. Programmer, gotta make sure I mention that. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, well, cool. we're super Super glad to have you. And um, yeah, this is one of the, you know, workflow tools that we, you know, we employed for Valley of the Ancient and, and Unreal Engine 5 that I think had, uh, you know, I guess it required us to change the way we thought quite a bit whenever we came to, uh, you know, to approach world building in general. And so I'm, I'm really excited today to, to hear um, more about some of the thinking behind it and share or have you share uh, a lot of the details about how it all works and you know what, what all is in it with the community so um, I think you've got some slides that you wanted to kind of walk through for starters yes yes I have some slides so great I'll start with that great all right um, are they showing up not just yet Houston can we get the slides up please you're good to go Thank you, Houston. Hey. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to start off uh, talking about uh, what are the motivations between uh, doing all these, ten these uh, changes. Um, so just a little bit of history. Um, in UE4, uh, actors uh, are saved in a specific level, right? So a world is composed of uh, a list of sub-levels and a persistent level, and the engine can stream in and out uh, all the sublevels uh, and the persistent level is always loaded. Um, and m moving actors between um, levels is a manual operation, so the user has to keep track of uh, the uh, current level, and you ha you have to select the level, the target level you want to move your actors in. Right click on the actors, uh, select uh, move to current level, and uh, it's essentially doing a cut and paste, so it can lead to uh, broken references and all, mm. all, all, all kind of problems. Um, and just moving actors around in space is not enough because it's just uh, uh, growing the level bounds, right? The current level bounds. It's it, it's not moving actors between levels. So uh, this is one right. thing that we wanted to uh, to fix. Um, 
And then each actor is saved its in own file, its own uh, its own le level file. I mean, so uh, if I work um, in a specific level and I'm changing some actors, and let's say that chance is uh, something he wants to change some other actors that are in the same level, but maybe they are 100 meters away. So we're not like uh, competing for for the the same things. Uh, even with that. Uh, Chance cannot work because uh, I have the level file in checkout. So he has to contact me and say like, hey, when are you going to release the file? And I might say 10 minutes and then release it somewhere after lunch. Yeah, and... that never happens. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then you cannot work in the meantime because you have to get my changes before. So uh, since we don't support like merging uh, map files, you have to wait. So you have to figure out like work on something else. Or... So. Right. It's one of the big problems. So to overcome this, the user would uh, make uh, changes to how they organize their levels in the editor. So making smaller level sizes or uh, making layers, uh, like a sound layer, a, a gameplay layer, uh, lighting layers. Uh, but one problem with that is that it it also affects the, the cook build, right? So when going into a cook build, you still have all these layers, all these uh, levels to stream, and it's not... Um, ideal for uh, streaming performances. So what we really wanted to do with uh, World Partition was to break the uh, how we organize the data in the editor and how it is uh, organized uh, in a cook build, right? Right. Uh, <clears throat> what, it's real quick on that note. Yeah, you talk about building things in layers so people can kind of work better together, but still it's kind of this, you know, kind of finite bucket of all those things inside that layer, right? And as things need exactly. to talk between those layers, it's really kind of tricky. Um, you still have to think really hard about where you put things. You can break things up a little bit by discipline type, but still spatially it might be similar to where something else is and without having that other level loaded, you know, and you still kind of have like a, a finite set of bounds as to far, how far out those things go. So building further out this way, there might be not items in the layers below that. You kind of still have to have the holistic view of everything else that everybody's still working on in those big binary blobs, right? Yes. So it forces teams to have some level of organization to make sure that everything is uh, at least uh, uh, f fine grained enough so people can work. But it doesn't have that much impact on the streaming performance at runtime. Right, so, right. So. Yeah, it just loads the whole thing in anyway. Just clump, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, the, there are uh, four goals uh, to well partition. is to first reduce contention, uh, then completely remove the manual level management, um, and to allow a tweaking of the runtime levels topology. So make a complete distinction between editor and runtime uh, levels, right? Um, and also to add automatic distance-based level streaming. So you don't have to uh, put uh, level streaming volumes or uh, have some kind of, uh, like, uh, have to write code like to, to stream depending on some conditions. Right. The, the, the user enters the elevator, and so you're streaming all the stuff behind the elevator out and all the new stuff in, in this new location, right? Yes. It's not, yeah. it's not something you have to think about the same way anymore. Yeah, exactly. But we'll have some some things are in the works, like to handle this specific case. Mm, but, okay. Uh, yeah. The 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 ninety nine percent of the time, what you want is like distance based streaming. Yeah. So the first thing to that we want to address is uh, file contention. So uh, that's why we introduce one file per actor. So that's completely uh, that's a a separate feature. So it, it can be used without world partition, but world partition cannot be used without one file per actor. Got it. So, oh, so you're saying that one file per actor can be used in existing non-world partition maps in UE5? Yes. Great. OK, cool. So it can be enabled um, directly in the editor, and the editor will just do all the job like to convert and add the files to perforce. Awesome. Yeah. So. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, one file per actor is uh, saving actors in their own file. So um, it's going to create a US asset file per actor. Uh, and these files are, are going to be stored in a specific folder that you can see here, just below my, my mouse. So in that, that way, the, the level does not track anymore what uh, actors it's uh, holding. Right? So uh, 
the act the level is just containing a, a, an empty uh, actor array, and that way we can add and remove actors without having to check out the actor the uh, the level file. So when you load a level, which is when it's uh, in one file per actor, uh, the level will just go into that folder and parse. It's just going to parse all the files there and load them. So it's auto discovering the actors instead of uh, keeping a list inside of the file. So if you're just modifying actors, you don't have to check out the level file anymore. So that fixes most of the contention that Teams, teams had. Right, and one thing we noticed specifically on that was, well, uh, something that, that I've run into quite a bit with UE4 or UE3 development in general is, um, occasionally it'll think that the U map is dirtied, and I don't think I changed anything in it, and it's not clear to me what got what got changed. Whereas with this, it tells me exactly the actor that I, as a designer, accidentally bumped that rock over, and I don't want to save that change. But maybe I was doing something later, you know, next to that, and. Uh, it was maybe some you know mission checkpoints or a volume that's for gameplay that I do want to have changed. And so instead of just checking the whole map back in, hoping that I didn't accidentally touch stuff that I didn't need to touch, I've got like a nice fine list you can see here in that change lists view um, yeah. that shows me, oh, I only need these changes. These other ones were accidents. And, and it's, it's very clear to me, which is super nice. Yeah, and one another thing that is um, a great improvement with that is that if you have uh, a level and contains like 1000 actors you just change one you're going to submit the whole file to uh, to perforce uh, and it means that if the file is let, let's say 100 megs uh, with one file per actor you're just going to submit a 1k or 2k actor file yeah. to perforce so it greatly reduces the the sync times and yeah uh, the storage on on uh, on on perforce and yeah. probably has an impact on integrations also Oh, I'm, I'm sure for integrations, absolutely. I think multiple times in working in Valley of the Ancient, we would sync things and parts of the map would be repopulated and then other ones would be what I still have currently and those kinds of things too. And there was no, no real contention whenever Team A versus Team B that are working on specific things or, or kind of stepping on each other's toes unless they're already talking about stuff they're placing in the same spots. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a real quick question um, on that. You talk about the actual molecular kind of asset change that you'd be checking in versus having to throw like a whole hundred megabyte map. Do we have any idea of, since we're kind of breaking up the, the concept of where that data lives, um, what does it mean for memory overall? I think for Valley of the Ancient, all of our external actors were only a few hundred megs overall and there's like 15,000 of them in there. Um, do, we, do we expect to see disk sizes for like say a map that had all those in it and then those separately to be about the same? Yes, it's going to be about the same because okay. uh, um, we're not changing how the file is saved, or it's it's it, it's going to be a little bit bigger because each US file has a file header and some some, some stuff, but uh, it's mm -hmm. going to be quite small, I think. Great, cool. Well, it's not it's not it's not some data that we've gathered, but uh, I would expect expect it to not be that much bigger. Yeah, so there's not really yeah. a whole lot of compromise. Not, you're adding a bunch of files to disk, but the disk space is still the same, and it makes those molecular exchanges with source control or other teammates way easier than passing them a gigantic blob. Yes, exactly. Great, cool. And you you know exactly as you said, you know exactly what you what you've changed. Yeah, and, yeah. that's great. So um, having that, it means that you, you you're going to have uh, larger change list, right? So instead of, of having a change list with one UMAP file, you're going to end up with a change list with maybe 10 or 100 actor files. Um, so we, we decided to add a, a source control integration directly into the editor to manage the change list, uh, um, to be able to create a change list, move files around. Uh, and one specific thing that is super important is that we added um, change list validations. So let's say that you have two actors and you've modified the two actors and one of these actors has, has a direct reference to the other one. So they need to be checked in at the same time. Mm. So we have validations that will uh, uh, that will not let you submit if you have these two files in two different changes. So it, it's going to tell you this, this file has a strong dependency to the other one. You need to move them to the same changes before submitting. Interesting. So it's kind of like if I were to update a reference on a material, that material will dirty the um, static mesh, for instance, because it knows that it needs that. Say, hey, you changed this. That might have changed something else here that you need to save. Or if I move a texture, 
it knows that it's kind of like the same kind of concept, but brought to the source control management. So you're, you know that your change that affects other things, it's going to bring those things along with you through this validation whenever you go to submit. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay. And the system is done. Uh, we provide a subset of um, validations, but uh, projects and licenses can write their own validations and can add to the existing validation. So uh, if you have custom stuff that needs to be checked in at the same time as your nav mesh, for instance, you can write a validation. So every time you end up figuring, uh, having a problem on the projection floor and you can just say, hey, okay, I can write a, a test to avoid that in the future. Uh, so it greatly helps uh, avoiding pushing stuff to uh, break uh, everyone's day. And <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, it seems flexible, and you know, since every game is going to be a little bit different, people can kind of go through and have their own sets of validations and make sure that teams are working and submitting things that don't break the build uh, here yeah. and there. But it, you know, in general, uh, some of the the validation that's there helped us quite a bit with that. We didn't run into a ton of that on working on Valley. Now, a lot of our world building stuff was mostly placement, um, but a few things that we did go in there and add. I did get, I did get ding to say, oh, you're you're missing the important things here that I didn't know that someone else had hooked up to that, and it was really helpful because it allowed me to then not um, revert somebody else's work on accident. Yeah. So the goal of the um, source control integration is is to be agnostic of the underlying source control software. So someone working in UE5 uh, will not be lo it will not be lost if it goes to a another team and they use Git, for instance, or mm -hmm. something like that. It's you are using the same source control software, and some feature some features may not be there, like. Some source control software might not support uh, shelving, for instance, or something like that. But right. the core of the experience will be the same. Yeah, and the and the color coding too is quite nice too, because it kind of tells you what type of asset you're going to be putting in, which is good. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Good yeah. breakdown. Super cool. So uh, yeah, so with World Partition, we introduce a new way to work in the editor. Um, so to be able to support very large worlds. Uh, we decided that it's impossible to load the whole world in the editor, so we need to figure uh, a way to be able like to select a, a region that you want to work in, and then just load that part. So when you load a partition world, at first uh, it's going to load an empty world. The only thing that will be there are the actors that are specifically marked as always loaded. Mm -hmm. So this is usually backdrop and vista actors and things like that. And then the users uh, select some cells. Here we just selected the two by two region and then right click load selected cells and it's going to load the the actual editor cells that contains these actors and then you can start working there. Um, as I said uh, before, it's it's needed for a very large world. Uh, I think that value of the ancient, if, if you have a, a good enough PC, you can probably load the entire thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but for for a no, normal PC, if I can say it, it it's not possible. So you have to load a, a subregion. And yes, yeah, this uh, this definitely comes in handy whenever you're trying to work in a big space and you can kind of move around. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing just kind of set dressing and and things like that, you can kind of operate section by section. But even if you're building gameplay, say you're setting up a spline that's going to move through the, the entire large space, or you need to. Um, you know, say you're going to drive down a street, you want to add checkpoints specifically, you can still get a lot of the benefits of this system by just loading the cell you need and maybe the one next to it and then unloading the next one and then moving all the way down. And that doesn't just remove it from the viewport, that hides it and actually takes out a memory as well too, right? So you're not paying for those resources at edit time at all until you need them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so right. the only thing is that if you load some cell and the... The trigger loading of like uh, some static meshes or some textures. Uh, unloading the cells will still keep these meshes and textures in memory, uh, okay. but that's how the the Unreal Engine works, right? So right. As a, a, as soon as you load some assets, they will stay there forever. But uh, there's no garbage collection in the editor. So right, right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, which is why if you load Valley of the Ancient, you run all the cells, you run through it the first time. It's doing all of its first. All oh, right, I'll pull all this stuff in for you now, and we'll move from yeah. there. Cool. And the, the minimap is generated uh, using a commandlet, so it's meant to be run 
um, nightly or maybe hijacking some other systems. Uh, I'll talk about it when we go over the H. generation because we we piggyback H. generation to generate the minimap. So, oh, cool. Very cool. Okay, so since the um, editor cells are completely disconnected from the runtime cells, so uh, we need to have a way to um, define the settings. Uh, um, so we are providing uh, a grid, which is uh, 2D um, spatial hash. Uh, that's, th that's the first grid that we'll be uh, pr providing for your UE5 initial release. We, we're, we're planning to release other type of grids, like maybe a 3D grid or something more adapted for a corridor based games uh, mm -hmm. but for now we're just focusing on 2d special ash grid because it's the it's the most common case with landscape and right. things like that uh, so you can see here the settings for the grid for the ancient world demo so the the cell size is 64 meters so it's 64 by 64 meters and the loading range is also 64 meters so it, it means that when playing the game in a cook build or uh, in a Pi in, in a Pi session, uh, the engine will automatically load everything, every cell that touches uh, the that that's inside the radius of uh, 64 meters around the player, right? So that, and, at, and that's a radius, so 64 from the location all yes. the way around, so 128 yeah. total. So if there's 64 size, that could be up to about four at a time. Yeah, got it. Exactly. So um, you can tweak these numbers and just hit Pi and everything will be automatically updated and it takes less than a second to go in by. So doing that with UE4 would mean, it would mean like going through all the levels, uh, taking all the actors, moving them back to the new, le the new level sizes that you want to stream. Uh, mm. it's, a com it's a complete uh, different type of uh, different beast. way to work. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You would probably write a command let to do that or... I don't know how teams ended up doing that, but yeah. Right. So right now you just change the value, hit pi, and it's there. Well, this is good too for you to to be able to test really quickly. Um, you just make this change, and you can redeploy to other targets just to see how streaming is going to work on your target platforms as well. Because yes. you kind of have like this what memory envelope you're trying to fit everything into. You got to test if your player can see the difference between the HLOD version and the full resolution version of things as you go. So this is a really powerful way to kind of tweak that out, make sure your performance is feeling just right, make sure you're fitting inside your budgets as well as, um, you know, your environments, your levels are designed in a way that the player doesn't even see that the streaming is taking place. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm going to show a demo after that presentation. Oh, great. Uh, okay, cool. Sorry. Directly inside. Hey, hey, inside. Jump ahead, oh, it's fine, it's fine. No, cool. And... Um, yeah, so we have uh, advanced uh, settings there, so you can create several grids if you want, like uh, if you want to have some objects that maybe will have a smaller loading radius, you can create mm. uh, another grid for that. Uh, uh, it, it's important to know that when generating the cook build, it's going to generate sublevels. So if you have two grids, it's going to generate twice the number of sublevels to stream. And so you need to be careful, so that's why it's in the advanced section. Okay. Uh, some words about the grid generation. Um, so at cook and pike time, the engine will generate sublevels, as I just said, um, and we need to generate uh, a hierarchy of sublevels because uh, actors can only fit in one sublevel. So uh, in this case, we have 64 by 64 meters sublevels, and then the higher level uh, a grid will have 128 by 128 sublevels and then 256 by 256 until we reach the point where we have a single level that encompasses the whole world. And that cell we call the always loaded cell because it's always loaded. The radius will uh, always be inside of it. Um, right. So if you have an actor that has a reference to another actor, they need to be loaded at the same time. So we need to compute the bounding box of all the references and find which level in the grid they fit into. Mm, that's right? smart. Yeah, so that way if you have something that's way far away and you need to, for some reason, get some data on it or react to some data on it, those will be moved up this hierarchy as to where they live and how they're loaded. Exactly. And so if you have two actors, one at each corner of the map, they will end up always loaded because of right. that. Yeah. Got it. So we do a, an automate, a 
automatic uh, reference um, gathering pass before uh, moving actors into, into the cells, and then we decide in which uh, level they, they will end up. Um, and also there's there's an advanced setting on actors, which is called grid placement. So uh, there's three different values. You can set actors to be always loaded, so they will always go inside the always loaded cell, uh, like for backdrop things and like things uh, at the distance that you always want to be loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the location. So it, it takes the location of the bounding volume of the actor to select which in which level they will end up. So they, they will never get promoted to a higher level because we just use their, their position to place them in the grid. So 99% of the actors should be in location. Mm -hmm. And then you have some actors that you want to set them by bounds because they are very big. So these actors will use their bounds uh, similar to the actor referencing problem. So they will take their bounds to select which level uh, can encompass them in this hierarchy. Right? Got it. So, um, and we have some heuristic going uh, behind the scenes uh, where if an actor is too big, and but you've set it to be location, but if it's too big, it's going to be promoted to using its bounds. Uh, okay. That was a problem in, uh, not a problem, but that, that was happening a lot in the um, ancient demo because the mass objects were very, very big. So yeah. Some of them were very big, right? So very large. Th they were promoted to the uh, higher level cells. Larger and, cells. Yes. So that explains why when you run the game without HLODs, you can see some objects popping before uh, others. That's right. because they are in higher level cells. Oh, that makes sense. And the same thing too. If you go into Valley and you or Valley of the Ancient and you drag and you unload all cells, you'll see our character on the ground and some of the stuff that's right there in front of you, as well as some of the mountaintop pieces that were easier for us to keep always loaded. They're fairly inexpensive. We may not even show the full geometry because the player can never get to those points. Um, but it'll look a little Swiss cheesy when everything's out there because we've marked some of those things as always loaded because that was the best result we could get. Um, using the system as we got there. And it's generally pretty pretty light even in that level if you just loaded that, if you loaded nothing else, which is great. Yes, yeah. Cool. Um, and then once the grid is generated, we have the automatic runtime streaming. So um, the engine will use the streaming sources. Uh, what we call streaming sources is it's, uh, it's defined by a, a position and uh, some other settings, uh, mainly a radius in that case. Uh, players are automatically acting as, as uh, streaming sources. So when you go into drone, uh, the drone is acting um, as a streaming sources. And we also added uh, a streaming source component to the character, as you can see on the right, because mm -hmm. we want to be able to go back instantly. So we want to keep things loaded around the player. Um, so that's how it's done. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, and the little line there is the heading, right? It's where the exactly. where the camera is is facing, so you can kind of tell exactly. the direction if it's moving. That's the way it's going to go. Exactly. So here you see the loaded uh, loaded cells in green, the unloaded cells uh, in in red, and there are some uh, empty cells here, which means that there is no because we're only showing the first level in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So these cells are empty because there is no actors in, in it because these actors that were touching these cells are promoted to higher, level level higher levels the hierarchy yes so it's not obvious at first when you look at this uh, debug display but there's uh, some debug options to show the other levels mm -hmm. so uh, using streaming sources you can use stream streaming sources to uh, prefetch a part of the world also so you can uh, let's say that you you know that the player is going to be teleported somewhere uh, you can uh, spawn an actor there with a streaming source component um, and set the settings to be prefetched, not active. So it's going to be prefetched, and once you're ready to teleport, you can just switch the active state of of uh, this um, streaming source and then teleport. Do a, a tele an instant teleport. And you can query the the state of that the yes, those cells, right? Once you know them, to know, hey, these are ready to go, and you can get yep. the teleport there. So it's always ready to go by the time you actually fire the event to move them, which is exactly. great. So that's how we did. Uh, th that's how they did the um, tran the transition to the dark world. Um, so we can activate like the, the I'm going there to the data layers, but uh, 
when you activate a, da a data layer, it's just going to stream actors in this layer that are around the player. So if, if you know that you're going to teleport somewhere before, you can also say this streaming source activate these data layers uh, from where I from where the from, player is. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, HLOD. So one thing that we wanted to do for HLOD was like to make sure that everything is automated. Automatic, so there's no no need to mo to make complex HLOD settings. Uh, you just set up a hierarchy of HLOD layers. Uh, so each layer is going to generate uh, its representation based on the um, uh, child layer. So the first layer doesn't have a child because it's the first layer. So it's using the the, the main world uh, as an input to generate the the low resolution re representation, and then the parent layer is using the other layer to generate. So if you have a very big world, you can set up several uh, HLOD layers, which are less and less and less expensive in memory, mm. but uh, you can represent the whole world with that. Um, so the, we have multiple layer types. Uh, one layer type is instancing. So it's it's creating one actor per cell uh, with a single component per compatible U asset. So if you have 10 static meshes in your world, uh, 10 static mesh actors that use the same static mesh, they're going to end up in this actor, using a single uh, instance component with 10 instances. Okay. So it's creating uh, a representation of the world that is um, a very lightweight to render. Um, so the, the instancing layer doesn't have visual quality loss because it's using the same meshes, same textures, uh, but it's just stripping away uh, all the physics and gameplay stuff, right? So the, 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 the instancing layer is just the visual representation optimized for rendering. Right on. And then you can create merge and simplified layers. So these layers will work on their child layer. So in in this case, an instancing layer probably. What they do is still create a one actor per cell, but they take all the meshes inside this cell and they merge that they merge that into a new st uh, st static mesh representing the whole cell. We run uh, simplif simplifying algorithms on that and. Uh, pre-render the, the materials also into a single texture. So it's really one drag call per, uh, per cell for a very distant subject. Oh, that's great. So if you, depending on your cell size, that can be relatively inexpensive across the board to get everything loaded and running. Yes, great. exactly. So uh, if you take a look here, a typical use case for a very open large world would be uh, let's say you have a loading range of 128 meters, so everything is fully streamed, physics, gameplay, everything is there. Then you can set up an instance layer uh, up to 768 meters. Uh, this layer is still streamed, so it, it's distance-based streaming also, but it doesn't contain physics. So right. from, from, the, from the 128 meters to 768 meters, it's just visual representation. Uh, and then you can set up another merge layer that will uh, take this the the instance layer as an input, generate uh, huh. merge meshes up to two kilometers, and then finally you can have uh, a, a, another merge layer that will take the this merge layer as an input to generate uh, two kilometers to infinity and set that layer to be always loaded. So at at, at any time you can like grab a an helicopter, go in the sky and see the whole world. Right. And, Everything looks fine. And as you come down, it takes from that big chunk and it gives the smaller chunk representations all the way down to the final pro res that you'd want once you're exactly. really up nice and close to it. Cool. So you can achieve this by just setting up uh, um, three layers in the editor and setting up the parent layer. And then you have a, a nightly process that runs. We support distributed generation on a build farm. so. I think uh, on uh, Valley of the Ancient, we were using 20 machines at some point uh, to generate uh, HLODs. Uh, and you yeah. can generate these via command line, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just running a command. So if you're just working locally, you can regenerate these things yourself. Exactly. And them. Yeah. yeah. Cool. But the thing is that the merge layers are very long to compute. So right. mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do local tests, you can just remove the parent layers, which are merge, and then just regenerate the H.0. I see. Uh, the, the, the instance layer. Uh, and as I said before, we we piggyback on, on the HL process to render the, the world minimap. So we're just using the last the last uh, HLOD layer to generate a top view, because it, it's oh, always okay. loaded. So. 
It right, just was right. Not- oh, it makes sense. And I, I think we ran into this on the project. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had times in our mini map where there were holes in the map because I didn't have all of the uh, the cells loaded in the editor. Like, does that happen at edit time? That generation? Like, uh, is it basically does it happen based on what you have loaded in the editor at the time? Yes. So okay. if if you render it inside the editor, it just takes everything that is loaded and. So if you yeah. just load a couple of cells, yeah. So yeah, load all load all your cells before you generate your mini maps, or you'll record some video with some holes in it that you'll have to go re-record. <laughs> exactly. As we found out. Cool. Okay, data layers. Uh, this is something that we added also uh, with uh, world partition. Uh, so it's on par with the the existing layer system, which was uh, an editor only uh, system, right? So. Uh, the existing layer system was there to categorize uh, actors, toggle visibility in the editor. Um, so the new system is on par with that, but it, it, it adds filtering of loaded actors in the editor and also uh, filtering of loaded actors at runtime. So um, for, for example, that's how we did the uh, dark world tra- transition. So we have uh, a normal um, data for the which is called campfire replace mm-hmm. and i don't know why it's not called light world but uh, called <laughs> you know names <laughs> yeah. and and then we have uh, everything that's part of the dark world uh, assigned to that data layer so when you go into the editor by default uh, this data layer is not loaded but if you want to work in this data layer you can just like unload this one load this one and it's it's only going to load actors part of that data layer for the cells that you have currently loaded, right? It's not going to load the 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 whole world. So it's affecting the current load set. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to clarify there for anybody that's uh, gone through this, <clears throat> you might see that there's a little bit of difference between um, having just these two data layers swapped in the editor versus when you swap them in the game and you run that. What we did on the actual change is we actually altered some global material parameter collections as well to change some of the things in the world as well. We're really using a couple of different systems to get the full effect across the two. This is the one where we have all the categorized assets that um, that we had built specifically for that on top of the base that is the campfire geometry base that does all the streaming in and streaming out, working well with World Partition. Just wanted to mention it. Um, and yeah, so uh, data layers can be also used for uh, several other uh, type of stuff. Like, l- let's say you have a mission where you, you need to collect all the stars. So you can just put all the stars into a special uh, data layer uh, for, for that mission. And at runtime, you can just enable that data layer and uh, the engine will start streaming still around the the streaming sources, but mm-hmm. it's going to start streaming all of these actors. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. I hadn't considered that whenever we were looking at this. Um, so you could put like gameplay objects. It just could be any actor that you can place in a scene, right? It doesn't have to be geometry specifically. It's no. just uh, yeah. it's anything that that needs to render uh, in the space, or I have some data that's on it. Yeah. Um, that's great. So most people think about that. Think about the data layers like to switch the the switch the world like night and day or things like that mm-hmm. but it, it can be useful for missions and yeah uh yeah things like that yeah or, or just a, a a broken broken bridge or something like that right um, yeah like if you have a persistent game and the player has pres- uh, proceeded to handle these missions and now every time they load up you need the world to be set a very specific way you can kind of do that. And I think yeah. from a workflow perspective too, like being able to toggle between the two and seeing what the bridge looked like before or after, you can kind of look at that real quick and make sure that this feels like a good state change for someone to come back into, which is super nice. Yeah, and you see the bridge in its two states inside the world. It's not a separate yeah. side of the world that you have to work in and you don't have a context of what you're working on. So I wonder too. Not, not, not I'm thinking. I wonder if you could use like some of like the the physics destruction things, you know, to kind of simulate something down and bake that in from the original where the bridge was, and then just save that into mark that for its own data layer, and then just kind of be done with the exchange between those two. That's pretty neat. Yeah, and data layer supports H load, so you can have specific H loads for the dark world or for a broken bit, broken bridge, like. Uh, if we take that example, if if the bridge is broken, we 
probably want to see it broken at, at a very bit far distance. <laughs> right, so, right. So you you can set up specific uh, HLUD layer here uh, for the the data layer. That's great. The uh, yeah. system's really really nice and intertwined. Yes. So uh, there's a a downside with that. Data layers will also generate sub levels. So you have to keep yourself from being crazy when using data <laughs> layers, right? And th that's why we added here the uh, little green and red circles. The the red circle means that it's a, uh, an editor-only data layer. So it doesn't affect runtime. It doesn't create sub-levels. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be used in the editor. So um, we have to make sure that we keep the number of runtime data layers uh, as low as possible, uh, or at least make some tests to see the impact on the streaming. And on that note, we actually combined all our data layers while we were building the <clears throat> project. I think we started with like six or seven while we yes. were learning how they all worked. Um, but a couple of the reasons we did that were for some quick performance testing too. A, a good example is we have foliage in the uh, campfire environment, the light world environment. <clears throat> and we weren't sure exactly how much of a performance that that was going to have for us. So what we did was we used the blueprints, which I think is next on your, your list here. Um, to toggle those off while we were running it and doing performance captures. So we would just would, you know, have it toggle those every few seconds. And then we could <clears throat> look at the profiling data and say, oh, our foliage is costing us this much. How can we minimize that, whether it be in optimizing the geometry or, you know, the uh, how many there are on the scene at any given time. Um, so they're, they're powerful tool, uh, too, just as a tool for you to kind of like work with your data. Um, and then we ended up, you know, collapsing them down. I think based on uh, your recommendation before we mm -hmm. ended up shipping specifically for that reason. Yes, but it's it's fun to see uh, how you you've used that to to do things that weren't like planned to be <laughs> yeah. to, to be done with that. So yeah, yeah. Cool. And just to mention that data layers can also be enabled via uh, blueprints and sequencer. Uh, we're adding a sequencer track. Oh, to enable awesome! And, and disable. Uh, data layers. Yeah, I know about the blueprints, but I, I haven't touched sequencer enough to, to to know there, but that sound that sounds great. Yeah, sequencer support is not there in early access. It's 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 in the works right now. So cool. Yeah. Uh, just a quick mention of uh, about blueprints. So uh, the level script still exists, but uh, every actor reference will be always loaded because the level script is part of the persistent level. So mm -hmm. if it has direct references to actors, they need to be always loaded. So uh, it's this, it's the same thing for blueprint classes. So if you have an actor with a blueprint class and you have uh, references to other actors, they will be bundled together and moved into the higher level as we saw before. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to take special care about that and favor we need to favor blueprint classes over level script for script that contains actor reference because of that. Right. Sounds like another reason not to use the level blueprint. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Th there are valuable reasons to use level blueprint on example, but yeah, in general, like good practice to kind of do your big quick prototyping, hooking stuff together there, and then move things out in modular self-contained managers and things that understand the state of the game a little bit better. I think early on, I think we had for this specifically, um, we had uh, a, a lot of the level switching code in the level blueprint or the data layer switching code in the level blueprint. And we ended up moving that, I believe, to game mode just because it was you know, a class that we could access from pretty much anywhere we needed to. Uh, we knew that it didn't have a whole lot. It didn't need to know a whole lot about the world. It could just call the functions that we needed on the world. Yeah, and that okay. seemed to work out really well. That's why uh, I, I was searching for the blueprint that activate and deactivate the dark world data layer. Uh, oh yeah, yesterday for the presentation, and I wasn't able to find it. So that, uh, that, yeah, I think it explains why. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's in game mode, and we actually—it's funny. Um, you see that you can do these things in sequencer. Um, the way I had set that up, I believe, was that I have sequencer calling into an object that actually accesses the game mode to make the transition because we need to have that separation between objects in the world and things that are actually affecting the entire world. So there's a couple of callbacks there um, to make that work. But yeah, I think it's in game mode. Oh, and then yeah. I, I will say too, uh, if you do dirty the map uh, with a world partition map, uh, 
chances are you changed something in the level blueprint or in, or in the always loaded actor. So if you are working in a world partition map and, and you think that they see that that needs to be changed, you may have changed a, a, a persistent actor, uh, an always loaded actor in the persistent world that thinks that, hey, I need to take the, the U map too, or you change something in script there or something else in that script got changed and that's where it got dirtied. So if you're yeah. working in the space and you think, I, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm using world partition, I didn't think I would need to check in the U map. You, you might take a look at what you did change and see if it's actually referenced in there because that will ask it to be to be saved and checked in. Yeah, and, and there there is a lot of uh, code paths that, that still uh, dirty the level instead of dirtying the exact object Instance, yeah. that, that is modified. So I, I think the, the rule of thumb is to submit the UMAP right now. If, mm. if it gets dirty, it's better to submit it because right. you can't know uh, what you've modified inside it. So, right. yeah. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, talking to a couple of the folks on the gameplay team and core, they're like, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions that have been made over the 20 years of working in new maps, right? That uh, we could probably have to rethink now going forward as we as we move to this system for, for UE5 and other maps. Um, so yeah. we can probably get a little bit more surgical with, hey, these are the areas we care about uh, inside that big data blob versus over here. These things are pretty safe to just go ahead and ignore. Yeah, but normally with one five reactor, there was there's a lot less um, scenarios where you you need to submit the the Yuma file, right? Yeah, it's only if you change like the the world setting. The world setting is not using a one file reactor, mm. um, and then I think it's it's about it. So yeah, normally you can go days and days without changing the Yuma. Even the even the data layers uh, option is not a UMAP. Right, no, thing, it, right. It's, it's, a, it's an actor just to yeah. leverage the one file per actor. So, yeah. Yes. So that's great. And adding data layers, removing data layers, it's 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 all just checking out the, the data layer uh, actor. Uh, we could have done one actor per data layer, like to really minimize <laughs> the impact, but we decided just just not go too wide at first. And it and it might be important to know on that too. Like, yeah, the the actor itself is the thing that saved an external actor. So that what data layers it's associated with is just more metadata on that actor, right? It's not exactly. it's not it's making a, a duplicate it's, version of it or something. No, it's just using the internal name of the data layer to. Uh, so if you de if you delete a data layer, you don't need to yeah. save all the actors that are part of that data layer. They will just discover that this data layer is gone when when you load these actors, and that doesn't even dirty the actor. So, That's great. Um, then we've converted several uh, systems to work with the uh, world partition. Uh, landscape was the first one. So landscape support is done by automatically splitting the landscape proxies uh, onto the grid. Um, and then you cannot paint uh, when you sh when you try to paint on the boundary that uh, shares uh, a boundary with an unloaded cells because it has repercussions on the normal maps of the uh, mm. the other cell and things like that. So the, the the paint, um, the paint tool will become red, and it, it tells a user, "Oh, you need to load that uh, specific part before." Uh, and that's just that's continue. just an edit time, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah so it, you, you're not saying that we would have foliage up to the lines and then move to the next one and foliage up to the lines. You just would need to load the edges as you're moving past the space that you're currently working in. Exact. Cool. And we we we've thought about having like automatic loading, so. It's the same thing for foliage. Uh, you speak mm -hmm. about it. So, foliage. Uh, you just paint actors in the map, and when when you arrive at the point where you're trying to paint uh, on a cell that is not loaded, it's just going to stop uh, scattering uh, right. yeah. foliage instances. And the foliage tool has been adapted, so it creates one foliage actor per uh, editor cell. So as as long as you paint inside uh, one editor cell, you're not going to create contention with the Another one. So mm -hmm. if you're painting a cell and I'm painting a cell, uh, I cannot start painting on your cell because you because you will have that actor checked out. Got it. So the landscape cell is a it's one actor uh, yes. itself, as is the foliage and everything and the painting, everything that goes on it is kind of considered like that slice of cake is protected as you're decorating it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's one actor containing uh, one uh, instanced uh, mesh, uh, instance static mesh component, and all the uh, 
uh, foliage instances, just go, just go in With there it. and yeah. Okay. So so before it was one foliage actor per level, right? Right. So <laughs> yeah. We had we had to do something. Um, uh, then multiplayer has been adapted. Uh, so uh, we have data layer support, so the server can activate deactivate data layers. One thing is that the server will load the entire world. Um, there's no solution for that yet. Uh, one solution would be to have uh, streaming on the server based on all the players' position, but that mm. introduces a problem with persistence. So let's say mm. I, you destroy a, a house in Fortnite, for example, and then you just move away, the server unloads that part, and then you come back, it loads it back. So That's right. we need to have some kind of persistence. So, uh, and normally persistence like that is handled with the server loading everything. Uh, right. So for 5.0, the server will load the, the whole world. Uh, we also adapted NavMesh. Uh, generating NavMesh needs, needed the, to have the whole world loaded, so it's not possible with full partition mm -hmm. because you can have a, a very, very large world. So the NavMesh generation has been adapted to load partially the world and go through uh, every editor cells and generate part of the NavMesh and do stitching to the final NavMesh I see. at the end. And that works with the hierarchy as well, too, right? Does that kind of match how, how those are broken up, or is it more at the high level? Um... Uh, no, no, because these uh, these are loading editor cells. Oh, editor so, side. I see. Yes. I see. Got it, got it, yes. got it, got it. Yeah. I think that would be a common problem to address, like the, 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 the difference between editor cells and streaming right. cells. Right. It's something that we have to wrap our head around. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, they're, and, they're serving a little bit of different needs, and so like, yes. uh, so yeah, it makes makes total sense. And uh, something that is not done is static lighting. Uh, it's planned for five dot two. We we have a plan for that, but uh, it's not done yet. Uh, okay. That's super cool. And one last slide about enabling and conv converting to uh, world partition. So um, to enable world partition, you need to go in the, the project setting and enable the world partition. Uh, checkbox here. Uh, it's not going to do anything at that point. What it's going to do is that if you uh, create a new level from the file menu, if you if you go file new uh, level and you, you choose a template, it's going to automatically create a partition world for that. So it's going to enable one file actor, uh, set up the grid with default values and things like that. So you can even create a new world from a template, place some actors, don't save, just press buy, and you can tweak the, the grid setting, press by, and everything works without saving anything. Gotcha. And that's because unsaved actors uh, are not streamed from disk and pi. They are duplicated to keep the, the changes that, that you did. Yeah. Uh, and opening a non-partition world when uh, this setting is set, um, it's going to ask uh, for, con for a conversion. So it's going to ask every time, do you want to convert that, mm, that okay. level? Uh, and co conversion is done through commandlet. So uh, essentially, the commandlet will just gather all actors from all sublevels, uh, migrate them, persistent level, uh, and enable one file tractor on all of these actors. Um, and it's going to open for delete all the sublevels that were there before. Uh, it, it's creating a change list, a complete change list of the conversion process. And um, yeah, so we've made everything we can to make the conversion process uh, as easy as possible. Uh, for instance, like actors coming from always loaded sublevels will be automatically set as always loaded for the grid, place, uh, grid placement. Existing layers are converted to editor only data layers. Um, and the conversion process can happen in place or it, it can create a, like a sidecar file so you can do comparisons because we don't expect. Uh, big uh, licenses, licenses that have big games, we don't expect them to run the conversion process and 100% converted and everything works fine, right? right? So we expect them to at least run a couple of times uh, uh, and make tweaks to the uh, config file and even probably write some code to handle specific case for their project. Mm -hmm. So having a sidecar file to be able to load the the or original world and then load the converted world and do some comp comparison is essential in in, yeah. in this case. Yeah, it seems helpful. Yeah, I, I assume if you're making changes from 
you know, a, a map or a stack of maps that's got some blueprint sublevel streaming code, right? You're going to want to make sure that that works with this. I assume, I'm assuming that you don't need to stream those things anymore. So if they're going to be you're going to be moving those things into data layers, you just would want to change out your blueprint functions from yes. stream yeah. this level and then instead say, oh, make these data layers active for these this location or exactly. the, whole, so the whole thing. You have like two options with in, in there. So you can change your source data and then run the, the commandlet, or you can mm -hmm. modify the commandlet code. It's, it's, it, it, it's done in such a way that you can like, create your own class of co conversion and mm. uh, override the function. So you can write specific code to uh, convert your own specific cases. Oh, that's nice. So it, internally, we at first, we tried to convert uh, Fortnite just as an internal uh, process. So we have a specific commandlet that derives from the uh, engine one, uh, mm -hmm. which handles all the specifics of how the data is set up. And, oh, right, yeah. yeah. Every every game, especially bigger games, like they have bigger spaces, uh, yes. are going to have probably very different needs because exactly. everyone's exactly. trying to do something just marginally different from the next at worst or at best and wildly different at worst, right? Yeah. Um, so. so we really expect them to write code and overload the, 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 right. the world partition convert command. It's, yeah. it's nice, though, that for those that aren't super complex, I'm sure a lot of folks that are... Um, dialing in or have got you know smaller games or games that don't have maps that have you know really convoluted level streaming mm -hmm. um you know uh code set up in there or they just have a bunch of ue4 games they want to try to test you know on the new systems they want to you know kind of move their projects up it seems that there's a, there's a pretty good path for them to do that i think when we did our, our map you know uh it was just a couple of days of trial and error and we already had a lot of stuff in the space right like we were we were trying a few things before we moved over to world partition yeah. So cool. And uh, the best scenario is uh, for teams that are using uh, world composition with all their levels uh, being, being distance based stream, because that's that's essentially what we are doing, but uh, mm -hmm. at an actor level. So converting these levels is, is will be easier for teams that are using world composition. Right, because it's yeah, their their code is basically doing very similar things as opposed yes. to yeah, exactly. some patchwork trickery exactly. that yeah but cool. it, it doesn't mean that they don't have streaming levels of volumes or uh, blueprints that triggers loading but sure yeah so uh yeah that's it for the presentation oh that's I great switch to the unreal editor da, da, da. so that's how it looks like when you start the game uh the start the game but load the map in the editor uh there is nothing loaded, right? Uh, only um, backdrops and things that were specifically uh, marked as uh, always loaded. And this is all. This is all considered persistent level for those that are thinking in the non-world partition terms. Like exactly. this is basically everything that lives at that U map level as it is at that highest most level of, of exactly. this cell. Yeah. Okay. That's a good thing to mention because in a cook build, we just move all these actors directly into the persistent level. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't need to load anything from the minimap. Uh, I can just hit pi. And because there's a complete disconnection between what's loaded inside the editor and what's loaded in pi, right? Because it's using the grid settings to generate the, se the, um, the settings. So mm -hmm. as you can see, I can load the map and start droning. And I didn't even load anything. Uh, Right, yeah. The editor still has nothing in it. Yep. Exactly. So we have some debug views. Um, if we enable this one, toggle draw runtime hash 2D, which shows the actual loading uh, of the grid. Um, if I move, you can see that we, we, have, um, we have a streaming source that is still on the player right now to keep things loaded. So I can just go back instantly. Um, so if I it's, go back. It's the X button, I think. Yeah, so everything stays loaded. Um, so I'm just going to show uh, playing with the uh, grid 
Distance. And, the, and the two you see here, one of these is the camera you saw just while she was sitting there, and the other one was her, right? So you can see that there's still two. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And she, she's always loaded. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Floating yeah. around. So uh, I can go here into the runtime hash, grid settings, and I can just say uh, instead of, of having uh, 32 cells, switch them to 64, just as a test, put 32 meters uh, for the loading range and just hit pi again. And then this is this is something that wasn't possible with V4. You had to completely move your actors through a complete different set of actors. And yeah. So yeah. you can see right now that the cells are, are bigger and the loading range is very small, right? Mm, just yeah. Oops, sorry. Must will probably really show it off what's going on. Do that again. I just stopped by by error. <laughs> you hit escape. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like the first thing I do is rebind that to like shift escape or something because mm -hmm. I push it all the time. I'm like, why did I do this? So yeah. So in in this case, uh, the loading radius is 30, 32 meters in, instead of uh, sixty four. So it means at, that after thirty two meters, it's the visual re representation of the instance. H load layer. So there's no physics after 32 meters. There is no gameplay elements, things like that. So uh, I can disable H loads just uh, for us to see. Well, yeah, so, I don't know. I don't know if we had mentioned the, the H load disable. There's a bunch of really great commandlets that will allow you to actually show what's going on. This, this is great. This is a really great debug tool that we were using to figure out what was going on numerous times building the project. Yes, and we plan to add uh, a, a, a different uh, different views uh, with coloring. So we want to have a coloring view that shows like all the different h -Lot layers, for instance. So you will see the bending of uh, mm. each layer with different colors. Uh, have different colors for data layers. Have different colors also for the grid promotion. Like you, you can know if your object has been promoted to a very high oh, level. Oh, different grid, version. Uh, yeah, list. yeah, yeah. Very cool. So that that's how it looks like without uh, HLUD. So you can see that this one big object that just appeared has been mm -hmm. probably uh, moved into a higher level cell. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which would explain to some of the holes you'll see in this. Uh, we were talking about this right before this. The holes you'll see in this graph doesn't mean that there's nothing in that space. That just means that the actors that are filling that space are either origined or bounded right outside of that, or they're in one of the hierarchy layers. So yes. you'll you'll see them load up whenever they're whenever appropriate. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to go uh, inside of this uh, wall partition view, and uh, I'm going to load some cells. So just select some cells and click load. And then uh, going to something. We have we, some. We have a ton of stuff in those four cells. Like it's so, yes, dense. It's it's so it's, dense right there. It's the most dense parts. Yeah. Okay. So we have a debug view in the grid uh, that helps you um, seeing uh, the runtime grid cells. So if you activate uh, preview grids here, into the grid settings, you have the actual uh, grid at runtime that oh, is displayed so nice. on overlay. So it can help you debug stuff like, let's say uh, I select this actor. So by the size of, of this actor, you can you, you can tell that it's going to end up into a single cell mm -hmm. uh, because it's grid placement is set to location. And it doesn't cover a, a huge part of the map, right? But if you select something like this one, uh, Probably that this one is going to be promoted to uh, one la one layer uh, on top because it's going to end up in that level here that is highlighted by my mouse, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, and if you really wanted to use bounds, as I said before, you can just switch its uh, grid placement here to the use bounds, bounds yeah. and then it'll just basically any cell that that sneaks into, it'll promote itself all the way up to make sure it's in the appropriate one. So anytime, yes. great. That is super. That is super helpful. I didn't actually use this much for this because I think that you were in here poking around and making some of these changes with us as well. Um, yeah. But this is that's a great tool, especially so if you're not trying, if not figuring out why mm -hmm. your your geometry is not or anything is not 
where it needs to be, being able to flip that and take a look at things very specifically is probably like huge, huge boon for efficiency. Yeah, it's it, it's just the beginning of debugging tools because we have a a, a ton of debugging tools that we want to write. Uh, like we want to have a, a heat map similar to this view here, but mm. a heat map with uh, let's say like the, how the memory taken by cells or uh, oh yeah, we, we could even have some miserable cell things like that. Um, and all the coloring uh, debug views that I said before, so that would be that would be uh, great improvements to this uh, basic uh, debugging view. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you change your, uh, let's say that I, I want to test with uh, 128 meters, it's like you can see directly the the change in the map. So you can tweak your value here and see directly the effect and figure out what is going on with these objects and how yeah, they would be cool. distributed in the grid and things like that. Um, another thing, uh, I just want to, uh, I'm going to pop up this one here to have a better view. So that's that's the, the, the minimap that is rendered uh, with the HR generation. Uh, if you select an actor in there, it's going to show the bounding volume of that actor inside the editor cells. So, mm. uh, oh, yeah. It, it's great for uh, like you select an actor, you click fo uh, focus selection, and then you, you can say, okay, it, it it's it's there, it's in these cells, and yeah, on uh, those on the stream, it, the compression might be squashing that a little bit, but there's like a nice sharp yellow kind of bounds uh, square that's being drawn on the mini map there. So you can see that it's just sneaking just outside of those two into two others. Yep. Uh, and then one thing that you will notice that the, the, that was not there before is that the world outliner can show now uh, unloaded actors. So mm. I'm, oh nice. So you can, if you need to work with that specific actor, you can just click on it and you can you you can click uh, you can click on focus actor bounds, and it's going to move directly where is it where it is in the map, right? Mm. So in nice. that case. You would expect it to be loaded, but it's not. It's there in the map. It, it's part of one of the loaded ed editor cell, but it's not there. So it's probably in a in a data layer. So you can right click on it and say load, uh, load unloaded actor, right? So it's loaded directly. Loaded. I see. So I just have to find it somewhere. How was it called? <laughs> yeah, I'll just take another example. Uh, Take uh, high 50. Okay, so it was called high 62. Yeah. So if I take a look at this actor and go into its data layers. Okay, so it's part of the data layer uh, campfire replace. So it's not a good example. It must be there somewhere. But I was just meaning that sometimes you can just click focus on that actor and it's not there. It, it it's still going to focus on the good actor, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's loaded or not. Um, yeah, because of it. so you can inspect uh, all the data layers per actor here going through there, uh, but you mm, can also yeah. you, you can also just go into the data layer. And and actors can be associated with more than one data layer. Yes. So, like, if you were going to switch from one to the other, but you need some things to stay persistent, you don't need a third data layer that's that persistent layer. You can just keep it in both and toggle between those two, and that actor stays where it's supposed to be. Exactly. That's exactly. nice. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to generate a sublevel, a specific sublevel for the actor that is that is inside two data layers. Because if we need to load that independently, mm -hmm. when you activate one or the other. We need to move all these actors that are parts of several data layers into their own sublevel, but right. it's all done uh, under the hood when you yeah when you I or you cook the. I don't have to think about it as like a level designer or something. Um, I can just say this is this version of the map that I'm trying, or this version of the space that I care about, and this is this version of the space I care about. I exactly. need these. This actor might be the same in both. I don't need to worry about what's happening with with sublevels or streaming or anything like that. Yeah, great. So uh, that's the data layer view. Um, if I go here and I want to work on the uh, dark world uh, part, I can just uh, first unload this one. So it's really going to unload 
th that part of the world, and that's why it's asking me if I want to save the because I I change an actor. So if I unload that part, it's going to unload that actor, and it's asking me if I want to save that actor or not. Right. right, because I'm going to lose my changes. So it's, gonna... it's basically like closing the level, right, or that level. Yes. That sub... yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah, it's it, it's the same behavior. So I'll just go, don't save. That's going to unload, it, like. And, and again, this is this is so nice because if I accidentally touch something and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I should save this or not. I'll at least know. Oh, I'm I didn't touch that butte. Uh, <laughs> revert that. Yeah. Galen will be mad at me if I don't. <laughs> And then I can activate the dark world, which is going to load uh, actors that are parts of the cells that I had already loaded. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that can, they're they're loaded. So, right. and we can also just toggle the the visibility if you just want like to switch if you happen to load both because you can load both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm just loading it again right. the most dense part of the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, this so, is this is something we did quite a bit when trying to understand what it would feel like switching between things, making sure things are spatially aligned. Um, some of the machines we have here with a you know ton more memory and whatnot, we were able to load everything all at once, all of it, both worlds, even before we had done any optimization, and just use those toggles there um, just to make sure everything was aligned right, and then we would unload the thing when we don't need it anymore. Yeah. So uh, we yeah so we, we can activate them. Uh, like just switch their visibility and without uh, having to go through the the burden of loading and unloading and that's just the same yeah. behavior as uh, activating or deactivating layers and in the old maps correct it's just it's just turning visibility yes. on those exactly well. yeah yeah that's cool and uh yeah so there there are several settings in on the the data layer so all these data layers uh, settings are persisted per user so when you close the editor it's saved so if you close it, the editor with the dark world not loaded, it's not going to be loaded the next time you load the, the level. But if you work on the dark world setting, uh, so you usually disable this one and load this one, the next time you load the editor, it's going to be at the same state uh, as you were before. Right. So, Which is, and, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say it's um, super nice for the way we had things split up because we had, we broke the map up for set dressers to have their areas. And so they're not having to turn stuff off and go to the right spot to turn stuff back on. And then also data layers as well, not just the partitions, but data layers as well. We had a completely separate team working on different parts of those as well. So everybody, when they load the editor, kind of had like a completely different map experience that's kind of catered specifically to what they were working on. Yes, exactly. And um, there is another thing yet. Yeah, so the, the, the world partition sales also are, uh, are, are are saved per user. So when you load the map, you just load the uh, the last of the cells that you. It, it, it's just to make sure that when you load the, when you boot up the the editor, it's in the last state that you were in before. Yeah, the last thing you want is to load the map and someone has loaded a whole bunch of new stuff in there that you're not expecting to to have to open and it taking like a lifetime. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But there is always the case where someone will load the entire world and it's going to crash and then. He, 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 he cannot load the editor anymore because oh. <laughs> it's always trying to load these. Sure. So sure. Uh, it it happened uh, during uh, ancient world development. So we just decided to at least save that setting when when you properly close the editor. So if if you crash, it's not going to be saved. Great. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's only on successful shutdowns, not exactly. I think abnormal shutdowns is what they're called in code. Uh, Aptly named. Then just a quick overview of the HLUD uh, setups. Um, so if you go in the world partition, uh, in the world settings under the world partition setup, you have the HLUD layer, which is there. Um, so in Ancient World, there's only one uh, uh, HLUD layer, and it's always loaded. But mm -hmm. uh, just for uh, the sake of uh, showing it, so you can. Uh, Disable always loaded here, and you can tweak the loading range here. So you can say, I want my HR layer to be 256 by 256 meters uh, cell size, and that's that's the loading range. Um, and then you Got choose it. between instancing and different types of uh, mesh merging and mesh uh, simplifications. Um, 
And then if you want to have another layer, let's say that uh, we want to have another layer, which is a, um, uh, a merge version of the, of the world. We could just go here, create a new layer, uh, save it here. And then just say, okay, I want to be it, be simplified mesh. And this is going to use this one because this one is, is its child. So this one is set as, it, as its parent and it's going to use the child layer to generate a simplified mesh with a cell oh, size of let's say uh, one kilometer wide and a loading range of or are always loaded if that's what we want and then we just save that and it's done we just wait for the next hr generation it's it's going to be there that's great yeah anyway. lots of little knobs in here to play with when you're testing and trying to make sure things are loading appropriately both with your native geo, a geo that's in here, and the actual HLOD versions, cell size, everything, and again, that'll be very, um, they'll they'll be determined almost exactly by what your game is and what content you might need. Like, say, if this had um, a bunch of buildings and streets, you know, there's a lot that we wouldn't need to load necessarily unless you could get above those, right? And so we yes, would probably have exactly. different HLOD settings, different things we could get away with with loading. Yeah. Um, cell we would size have and whatnot, right? A data layer, let's say for rooftops and uh, <laughs> things that you would just enable when you go into a, a chopper or something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And then I think that's it. That's uh, great. Yeah. Just something to mention. Uh, one plan that we have is to show HLA directly into the, the editor also. So instead of uh, showing empty space for unloaded areas, we would display HLODs that directly inside the, the editor. Right. So uh, one step further would be to completely remove the need to load the cells there and just use camera streaming inside directly inside the editor. So that's oh, that a, would be nice. That's a far fetched goal. That yeah that's on that's on our track. Um, and this is like the 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 the, the the dream that we want to, to achieve is, is to be able <laughs> right. like, to just navigate in, in the editor, seeing HLOD and having automatic streaming uh, and remove the minimap. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Um, well, it's super cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for sharing everything there. I, I mean, I, I've been working with the tools for a little bit and I've learned a, a handful of things that I, uh, I didn't find out working with you on this or just by yeah. nature of poking around. So really appreciate it. Lots of, lots of really good information in there. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Ready for some questions? Uh, yes. I think we have numerous. Sure do. Um, kick it off. I think it will be, since today's topic, we're fairly concise on just world building. I will, um, we'll just dive right in and, and shoot them off one at a time here for the stuff that you haven't already addressed. Um, first question comes from Sergio Free, who's wondering, will data layers be available for non-world partition levels? Uh, the answer is no, no. It's really developed. It's really de developed on top of a uh, world partition, so it's leveraging the fact that we generate uh, sub levels um, directly at cook time. So uh, it's really a feature of world partition. Yeah. yeah, I think if you're if if you can't move to world partition for whatever reason, you would probably still just use a sub level model. Yes, exactly. And at some point, every level in Unreal will be partitioned. So. Next question comes from UEFI Project Storm, who's wondering, what are the default world size limitations for world partition? In UE4, it was 20 by 20 kilometers. Uh, yes, so it's it's the same limitations. Um, we have some development in flight to uh, be able to enable larger worlds. Uh, but right now, it's the same limitation as before. But there is something uh, ongoing to uh, be able to support uh, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from the origin. Yes. There has been several questions in regards to um, sort of a, a different landscape solution. Um, several people are sort of wondering if, if there's any work uh, in regards to landscape to be able to make it work better with world partition, runtime virtual textures, nanite, um, et cetera. Do we have anything to share there? Yeah, so world partition uh, has direct support for for landscape, as I mentioned before. So 
uh, landscape proxies are directly created on the grid. So uh, you can partially load the landscape uh, inside the editor and work from there. Uh, but I cannot answer uh, for an Nanite. Uh, there is no Nanite support for landscape. Um, but does the future that will have support? Landscape? I don't know. <clears throat> Um, I've got one here. It says HLODs and landscapes from Carlos Pires. It says, how is it possible to see far tiles with high HLODs in an open world with world partition? I think you kind of answered that. You'll have maybe some of your buttes and big stuff that you can never get close to, always loaded, and then your HLOD will be at some layer that will populate all that space out, right? So Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so normally we you would set up your uh, HLOD layers uh, hierarchy, uh, have a final layer that is always loaded, right? So it's a layer that is always loaded. It's it's the um, the most simplified one, so it it should take uh, less uh, memory. Um, and unless you have a game with fog or something like that, that you can hide very far away objects. Yeah, but nice. um, I don't know if the question was specifically about uh, landscape, but we don't have landscape support uh, for HLODs currently, but this is planned. Uh, cool. This is not in early access. That was the, a couple were asking that, so thank you yes. for addressing that. On on the same note, in regards to sort of being able to see objects in the far distance, um, someone was wondering here if you you know have a game such as like a sniper game and you want to look really far, um, does that involve similar techniques such you were talking about sort of teleporting where you want to manually load those areas or or what what does that look like? Yeah, so that's a common problem, like uh, sniping through a, a part of the world that is not uh, fully loaded. Um, this it, it it means that you 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 need to load, right? So if if you know in advance that you're going to to snipe there, like for a scripted sequence or something like that, you can have a streaming source placed there and make sure that everything is streamed before you zoom in. Uh, but if the player can zoom in at any time. At any far distance, uh, that's an that's an unaddressed problem. Yeah, you have to figure out ways to hide the fact that you're zooming into each shots. Yeah, it's a common creative. problem between games. Yeah, yeah. That have a snipers and potentially yeah. creative content solutions there too. Some mm -hmm. combination, I think, of being able to prefetch some of the information. Um, yes, maybe with some it. smart work with uh, H lods and how you built them. Um, and then yeah, content. So tricky. But even if you zoom in in a part that is not loaded, so you're not supposed to have uh, replicated uh, players there. So normally you're not supposed to, to see gameplay elements there also. So hmm. it really depends on the game. Maybe a game with a sniper that can snipe at a distance of one kilometer will have its main loading range set to one kilometer. One kilometer. Yeah. Comes down to yeah, where where do you spend your budget? What's most important yeah. for your game? <clears throat> yeah. Another question is from Charles Cox, who's wondering: Will Unreal Engine's water body water body system work with world partitioning? Yes. So the new water system that uh, we're currently developing is uh, currently uh, going under work to support world partition. Um, it's not there in early access, but it's planned to be there in the initial. 5.0. Cool. Um, Chance, did you have one? Uh, no, I'm I'm digging. There's a, there's okay. a very very dense document of questions. Some yeah, you, here, I've been so. trying to make some space, you know, yeah. since you asked oh, me for that, or you've been doing it earlier. Oh. Um, so in general, we've seen a lot of questions in regards to world partition, um, and I guess U5 in general when it comes to large worlds and multiplayer. Um, Moss 306 here specifically was wondering, uh, will World Partition work with listen servers and clients or just dedicated servers like World Composition? Uh, yes, so it, it works with um, listen servers. Uh, the thing is that the server needs to load everything. So Everything, uh, okay. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. so the most common case will be running servers on dedicated machines uh, that can afford to load the, the whole world. Uh, it really depends on the game and how the servers and on which machine the server runs. Yeah. But yeah, so in future in future release, we plan to have server streaming and add a persistent uh, persistent system on the server that would be able to 
at least uh, get objects back to their states before the the cells were unloaded. So that would allow for sort of single shard, but with individual cells loaded, depending on where players are. Um, exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's super exciting. Um, All right, I've got one here <clears throat> um, because I think I've asked you this, uh, JF, a bit in the past. What do the debug colors mean when you're looking at you know the the cells, whether it be runtime? Um, well, like there's greens, there's reds, there's purples, there's blues, there's light blues. Um, okay, so um, I don't know all of them, but I know that green is loaded, um, red is uh, unloaded, but waiting for garbage collection to 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 pass and unload this uh, all the stuff. Uh, purple means that the level is currently being unloaded, but not it's not on because it's an iterative process over several frames. So purple it's, it means it's in the process of being unloaded. And um, red, it's unloaded, but waiting for garbage collection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's all happening asynchronously. So there's varying states between just on and off. And I think, yes. too, like... Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I just said yes to what oh, you, great. you were saying. And, and I think, too, there's a really good um, something. Uh, I can't remember who on the open world team mentioned this to me, but uh, it, it re helped me so much understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Stat levels uh, yes. is a great command. That just tells you everything that's trying to load. Um, so just stat space levels, the same way you would do like stat units, stat FPS, stat GPU, anything like that. Um, it'll list out all the individual cells with their like data layer hash and everything. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Green means loaded. Light blue means loaded, not visible, or something like that. And so you can kind of it's watch seven, what's... It's even written uh, at, the, at the right of the, the level name. If it's loading, unloading, uh, it's written right, in Right, yeah, it's right. written in there. So if you if you do a stat levels while you're moving around and doing stuff, not just in like the hash view, you can kind of see the state of the, the layers below you and what they're doing, or the cells below you and what you're doing and what data layer itself is actually doing. So um, one thing we did for uh, Valley of the Ancient early on was we were testing prefetching the entire dark world to see if we could fit all that into memory. So the transition could be a lot shorter. We actually ended up shipping with that disabled just because... Um, the first time you load the editor, it was going through the churn of trying to get everything like loaded into memory. So you hit play an editor, and it's like a slideshow for the first, you know, a uh, few seconds. Um, so we didn't really want to do that. There's there's a way you can do that. I think that's in the in the game mode script. We do a prefetcher maybe in the yeah. the the world um the level blueprint. But um, that's a really great way to know. Oh, everything is ready to go. Especially if you're using blueprints to kind of like query the state of things, you can you can match what you see in stat levels with what's with what your blueprints are telling you is actually loaded to make sure everything is set up appropriately. They use that heavily. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Just some on on the debug uh, topic. I figured I'd mention that. And just to get back to the stat levels that you you, you just mentioned, uh, it's a good way to to see how much levels are generated. So you can go in by. Use stat level, and you will see maybe hundreds levels uh, in flight and currently loading. And then you change your grid settings, double the size of the cells, and then you can see the direct impact of the number of levels mm, yeah. that are loaded. And it's like four times less just by doubling the numbers of, of cells. So uh, yeah, you can yeah. see the impact of uh, changing the grid settings directly. Very on the, very on the helpful. Level streaming. Tool. Yeah. Very helpful tool. Right. We have two more questions. I think you just discussed a little bit, but these two questions come from Rodolfo Pisati. The first one was, what tools does U5 have to monitor amount of data being streamed per data layer and grid? Apart from stat levels, we don't have tools right now to monitor these. Uh, um, but as I said before, we want to have a heat map. will show the amount of... Uh, the amount of data that per cell. So it's going to be a heat map for the runtime cells, not the, the editor cells, obviously. Uh, all, all of these tools are currently in the thought process, so there's nothing done yet. Um, so yeah, that's in flight. And then the next question from Rodolfo is, will there be support for data layers within data layers or groups? Yes, this is something that we've talked about. Um, so having a hierarchy of data layers. So if you activate a top level data layer, is going to activate all the sub uh, data layers. Uh, that's something that we've talked about because the need has come up uh, for some 
internal uh, mm -hmm. efforts. Project. So yes, we are still uh, going through the thought process of how it how how it would look like and uh, how it would be to the user to understand how how things are organized. But yes. Let's see, I've got a good one here. Uh, we we kind of touched on this earlier, um, but from Tyler, having the ability to change grid size is great, but is there a sweet spot where changing out numbers outside of the defaults are likely to be less performant? And I think the answer is depends on your game, depends on your platform, depends on numerous things that are important to you. But I think the defaults are pretty good for just to kind of poke around and as, as a good starting point. Is that right, JF? So the default should be fine for... Um... Uh, most testings, but if if you have a game that is very dense or uh, or a game that has uh, very dense areas and then some areas that are very uh, sparse, uh, you will have to tweak and will probably have to make two grid case. Um, really different. Each game is really, is different. And one thing to mention is that the loading range is dynamic, so. In game, you can change the loading range dynamically. So, like, let's say that you have uh, some places in the map that you want to have a, a bigger loading range, and then you enter the city, you can just lower the loading range to get some memory back before you're because you're streaming more dense. Uh, right. Points. I didn't know that. So that's great. So, like, if you're if you're in like if you have a city that goes out into like an expanse, like our Moab Desert. You could have it small for when you don't see the things in the super like far distance, because everything here is really dense. You have like a ton of stuff you're trying to load in. There's so much in memory at the same time, and it's all kind of close to you. So you don't really care about anything outside of that. You can get really, really, really um, like detailed in those spots. But maybe you enter a volume on one side, and you're looking in a specific direction. You have blueprint logic that says, okay, when you're here, we can make the loading radians a lot bigger. You're going to be walking out this way, drive a car out that, unload everything behind you and everything yes. in front of you is loading in because you can see it all. That's great. Had another question from Loresh here who's wondering, what happens with these one actor per cell setups if you need to change the editor cell size later on? Okay, so the editor cell size is really um, uh, a helper because uh, when, you select si when you select cells in, in the editor to load, uh, it's actually just doing an an intersection between uh, the bounding box of the cells and the actor. So you can change that value uh, as much as you want. The only thing is that you probably have to just reboot the the editor. Uh, there's nothing tie. Uh, there is nothing that is tied to the editor runtime cell uh, editor. Right. So you can. It's not exposed because there is no real. There has been no real need to change that, uh, but we we could expose it and like change it and just restart the editor. Everything's. Um, let's touch on one here. I think we we kind of mentioned earlier, but I don't know if it was the question was asked this way. So I have uh, Simon Finney asks, "How will projects transition from world composition to world partition?" I mean, you talked about the transition itself being a little bit smoother because of the way that World Composition does streaming, you know, kind of past a certain point. Um, will the commandlet work with that, too, to move from a standard map to, or a world, world Composition map setup to a World Partition map setup? Yes. So the the um, conversion commandlet will take, because w w when you have a world using World Composition, you have different layers with different streaming distances. So what we try uh, doing the conversion commandlet is to keep these di these distances, and we create one grid streaming distance that that you had in your world composition. That that's an option, but uh, if we want like to to respect exactly the current setup, we we do that. Um, and since most of the world composition games are set up using tied uh, level setups, it's easier for us just to convert the world composition levels to world partition because of that. But as I said before, if you have custom logic like to trim some sub-levels or level streaming volumes, you will have to address these uh, yourself, like post-conversion or uh, during mm -hmm. the conversion process. 
Cool. A little bit of um, chatter and questions in regards to um, not only horizontal word partitioning, but potentially vertical. Um, and there's a question from Roy Awesome who's wondering, will world partition support 3D parti partitions? Can we use it for a space game? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it's not provided in the official uh, UE5, the initial official uh, UE5 release. Uh, this will contain only one type of grid, which will be a, a 2D grid. But the system is done that uh, that you can extend and write your own grid. So um, the the plan is that we will provide a full a fully 3D uh, solution in the future, so you can have. Uh, Space game, for for instance, and uh, we also want to provide grid types to support uh, more traditional uh, radar-based games. Um, so the the answer is yes, but if you need it, like at the at the moment of the UE five release, you will need to write your own hmm. for that. Okay, chance. Let's grab some of the questions. I saw you started there from the, the forums, and then we also have some from previous streams. Right. We tackle dedicated. Um... It's funny, the, the 3D one, I think, knocked out like seven or eight of the ones. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, so. So good. Th there was a, a question uh, on the uh, in initial announcement uh, about NavMesh. So I think the mm -hmm. question was, uh, does NavMesh will be streamed? Uh, so for now, NavMesh is not streamed. Uh, um, I know that it's in the works from the, the team that handles NavMesh, but uh, currently the NavMesh is always loaded. So it's it's generated partially uh, using the partial loading of the world, but it's just stitching different parts and making one huge NavMesh for the whole world. And normally that's the server that, that is going to load the NavMesh, so it doesn't make a difference. But if you have a a single player game and you want to stream Navmesh, uh, I don't think it's going to be there for 5.0. But it's planned for like 5.x release. It's a work in progress. Yes. All right, I've got one here because this is one that I asked you, I think, back in February. Um, is it possible to get a blueprint callback for when a data layer has finished loading? Um, so for what we're doing in, in Valley of the Ancient, you'll see as we we tell the system, we tell the data layer system or the world partition system to load specific data layers, and then we do a quick query based on where our player is to look for those to be finished. And then we have that set up on a timer. I think I put it to something like a quarter of a second. So that way every it does four times a second. It's not wholly ticking. Um, but then when it's done, it clears that timer. Is there any, is he planned to move that into this kind of like a, a callback or like a blueprint event that we combine too? Yeah, so this is a question that has been uh, asked several times um yes yes it, it's possible so r right now you have to resort to uh, doing polling as you just described uh, uh but uh yes it, it it's something that we we plan to do we don't know how it's going to be like if you would tie that to a specific actor or just broadcast uh, right an event uh, it's not clear but uh it's something that it's it's something that we have on our to-do list for sure yeah you'd have to have some persistent object that you could bind to yep. you know one of those delegates right yeah. yes uh, unless you want to broadcast something to the level script right 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 which you could probably do in in code right now if you were to dig down and write something that way and mm -hmm. then broadcast yes. that up yeah. yeah next question comes from sebastian lutz who's wondering is it possible to mix world partition with a regular streaming for the interior probably for like an interior building Yes, if you want to write some code for that, uh, it's still possible to uh, stream sublevels. In fact, it's, I'm pretty sure that if you place uh, uh, sublevel streaming volumes, it's going to work. The only thing is that the the, the level window is disabled in the in, in what partition, so you won't be able to add sublevels directly to the. Mm. Uh, but with some custom code, it's still there. So if you have like parts of your game that it that you need to continue using that scheme uh, you could probably work around and you, you wouldn't you wouldn't get any of the benefits right like of the hashing and the loading of specific stuff if you just loaded no. your other level unless it was converted and then it's just converted you're not using you're not streaming it in right? exactly yeah um 
right. Yeah. Still going through and crossing out some of the <clears throat> 3D and vertical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's the is it the most requested thing on on the chat or? Uh, there were definitely quite a few questions in regards to that, but I, I got another one from Lorash here. Um, can lighting be baked into data layers similarly to how they can be baked into sublevels in UE4? Sorry, when so it works. Yes, it's, it's, yes. So when static lighting will be working, uh, for sure we'll have to support uh, data layers. I think we uh, lost oh, no. it, there, Jeff. You can you can mute it on us. Am I back? Yes, yes you are. <laughs> I did not expect that to work. All right. Great. That's fantastic. Uh, so yes, we will have to support um, data layers for static lighting the same way we support data layers for H LUDs. Uh, yes. So if you have a dark and light version of the world, you will need, you will need two different versions of the uh, static lighting. Yes. Right. Lorish had another question on, I think, the same forum post. Um, how should, and I, I like this one, how should you four levels be built today to best prepare them for a world partition upgrade? Yeah, so one of the main thing is to uh, uh, make sure that you stream level based on, on distance. So if you're, if you're using world composition, that's, that's the best scenario. And if you're using, uh, some, of, some games have custom code to uh, implement uh, distance-based streaming directly in the in the game, but if you're using volumes, uh, streaming volumes, make sure that they are evenly placed in the in the world. Because if you rely on the fact that this part will be loaded uh, just from that radius and that part will be loaded from that radius, uh, it's not going to properly port to a world partition. Um, yeah, so the main thing is to go away from custom code that is not just distance-based uh, streaming. Yeah, and don't rely on uh, enabling and disabling uh, levels like uh, uh, let's say that uh, you have some some part of the world that, that trigger loading of a sub level just to uh, to do a scripted sequence or, or or something like that. This will need to be ported uh, to be using data layers. That will need to some custom at custom attention during the uh, the conversion process. Um, I've got one for me in here too. Uh, it's a silly side, but uh, does Chance like blueberries? And sometimes, I guess, like blueberry muffins, maybe in a smoothie. I, don't know. I have blueberries for breakfast. Oh, that's good. Yeah, oh, likes blueberries. I, I love I, blueberries. I like most berries. Most berries are pretty good. Uh, some of them. Looking at you, blackberry. Not a fan. You're a little outside of my taste. But I'm allergic to blackberries. Oh yeah, don't eat those. No. I try not to. They stain what your clothes I... too. That's that's my big thing. They taste pretty good, but they stain my clothes. I get I get messy. Right. Moving me, on. I... Yeah, go ahead. No, no. No, I was just <laughs> saying that I, I cannot eat blueberries because the kids always eat them. Yes. Don't have that problem in my <laughs> my apartment here. It's off topic, but a blueberry is. Like the the juice is purple, the inside is green, but the skin is blue. They're an enigma. I don't understand. <laughs> Nothing makes any sense. Aren't bananas also technically a berry if you're looking at it and scientifically? Yeah, would they be a yellow berry then? Is that all right? All right so let's go. We digress. Yes, we digress. <laughs> that never happens. I'm. Um, uh, I think you've done a pretty good job so far, yeah, Jeff. We're, sure. um, and we still I, have the forums. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, for everyone who might have joined late, missed some questions, or if you're looking for the future live streams, check out our the event section in our forums. Uh, that's where we announce all of them. And that's where the best part to participate in the conversation post-stream takes place. Um, so if you have more questions for Jeff, or if you want us to clarify something, um, go ahead and uh, we'll we'll link that in chat uh, right now, and you can go ahead and ask your questions there, and we'll we'll keep an eye on that thread. Yeah, um, I want to say um, yeah. Anybody that's working on things in UE five, first and foremost, we've seen all kinds of stellar stuff come out of the community already, posted online on the forums and whatnot. 
Um, show us what you're working on with World Partition and some of these new and and you know data layers, Moonfall Proctor, everything we've got in there. If you're working on some crazy large sprawling map, we'd love to hear about your experience there, some of the things you're running into, things you thought you couldn't do that you can, or vice versa. Um, we're always looking to hear from you. Um, so yeah, just let us know. We're we're excited, excited to get this in your hands. Uh, JF, you've been working on this for quite some time now. It's probably super cool to see, you know, a bunch of people finally poking around with it. Yes, yes, there, there's a lot of YouTube videos already, like uh, how to uh, how to set up World Partition and things like that. And it's 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 really um, it's really fun to uh, listen to these and and see what the community will do with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I found a question from Qua here uh, from the first stream. Does World Partition still use world origin shifting? Uh, the answer is a no. Um, there is no support for that. And, and that's because we have another development in flight, which is to support very large worlds. Uh, so world shifting is, is probably going away uh, with that development. So more news to come, I guess. Yeah. H had another one good here from Mayhem Mirror. Um, is world partitioning supporting procedural levels at runtime? And they're clarifying, for example, streaming different sub-levels per tile each time you play. No, that's not something. That's something that was possible before because you could have set up your game using like uh, uh, legal tiles, and then you just set up your streaming to choose randomly uh, a sublevel that fits with the one that that uh, that you want to stitch. In and uh, that's not something that is possible right now because we're just taking the the whole world and putting that into sublevels. Uh, but I could see some extension that could be done to support that. But out of the box, World Partition don't support that. Seems like you could probably be very deliberate about how you set up your cells and do a lot of your procedural generation of content inside Blueprints. And, you know, it might be a little heavy-handed to go, um, you know, for callbacks every time a specific cell is loaded to generate things, but you could precede a lot of that and then put them out there and kind of build yeah, larger procedural worlds using that way as opposed yeah. to using levels to stream them in. Yes, exactly. But uh, I guess that writing a new grid type for that would be the best solution, I guess. So mm. the grid type controls everything that how things get packed in into levels and how things get loaded. So uh, I think it's a mix of what you just said and a new grid type. Mm, yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. Well, right. I think that might be it then. And I know that Chance would be very happy if that was it because he has a very important <laughs> meeting to go to. Oh, it's all good. This has been a, a great pleasure chatting with, with, with you all today. So. Same, same. Su super excited about this feature. I'm really, I'm, I'm really, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really curious to see how it changes workflows for a lot of us that have been doing things, you know, the standard way, which is patchwork, big quilt style, putting stuff out in the space, rethinking it, chopping it up, like you said. We don't fit in memory on this uh, console, so we got to change that a little bit, or we don't, um, you know, I can't see this thing from there, so I got to make this one piece kind of special for some reason and make sure that it's always there at the end of my yeah. map and kill it by the time I get there, you know, it's some crazy stuff. I didn't talk about like having a, a per, per platform grid, grid cell size and things like that, but that's something that we have also. Oh, fantastic. In yeah, flight. that'll be a huge help for for um, games that want to, you know, deploy across numerous types or classifications mm -hmm. of, yeah. uh, of platform, so. Yes. And I guess it's also worth mentioning that this is early access, and the last thing the documentation team wants to do is to write documentation on things that will most certainly change. And so, you know, for 5.0 full release and, and in the future, expect more documentation, samples, learning projects, everything that we sort of have for our UV4 right now will be made available for UV5 as well. It's just early days and some things are still a little bit in flight and being worked on. Make sure that they're as good as they possibly can be. Um, so stay tuned for that. I did see some questions about that as well. And you can just sort of always expect that new feature, you know, that we know is impactful in the industry. We'll probably go ahead and try to make sure that it's it's easy for you to learn how to use it. Yeah. Okay. All, all right. Well, um, 
I'm going to do my little outro spiel, and then I think we'll get going. Um, appreciate everyone hanging out with us today. Jeff, big special thanks to you. I'm going to do that once again Yes, well. thank you for the presentation. Super informative, yeah. even to me that's used the system. So thank you. Oh, and welcome. I was going... Go ahead, Jeff. I just said, you're welcome. <laughs> I was going to say, even though, you know, if you're experimenting with the new, new world building features and you don't have anything in particular that's, you know, super visually stunning or original, go ahead and still share your experience. We are very much inclined to know what that is like, even though it might not be the most, you know, stunning, you know, lumen nanite, billions and billions of polys going on. Um, we're still curious to see what your experience is. So go ahead and post that and tag us on the forums or uh, Twitter. Um, if you've been watching from the start, thank you for hanging out. If you haven't, thank you for hanging out. I should probably add that to my little thing here. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to everyone. Um, we do go ahead and transcribe the live stream every week. And so if you were curious about a particular words we were using or um, you weren't able to understand what we were saying, uh, about within seven days of the time that we go offline, we do have a manual transcript that our wonderful captioneer uh, puts together for us. It gets added to the YouTube VOD, so go ahead and head over there. You can also download that PDF and actually go ahead and see all the timestamps when we said things. And so if the timestamps that we add to YouTube are not enough, you can go ahead and do a control F and search for some key terms there in that document to find when we were talking about it. And that to for all of our live streams. Um, if you are new to Unreal Engine and you'd like to get started, you can access it from unrealengine.com. If you already have the Epic Games Launcher installed, you have a tab right there for Unreal Engine, you can go ahead and download both U4 and U5. Um, easy said, easy as said, easy as I said it. There's That's not an English express. And moving on, um, our meetup groups are still throwing virtual meetups around the world, uh, no physical in-person meetups are happening during the pandemic, but you can go to communities.unrealengine.com to find those groups, um, go ahead and join them. If you are curious about forming one of the meetup groups, there's a button in the top right corner to become a leader. You can go ahead and fill out that form and get in touch with us, and we will get back to you. Um, as we mentioned previously, all of our, everything that's going on in the community is exciting. Um, if you do want to go ahead and make sure that you let us know what you're working on. Uh, the forums are a good place. Uh, we got unrealslackers.org is our unofficial Discord community, as well as Facebook, Reddit, Twitter. Um, we might go ahead and pick one of your projects as one of our community spotlights that we do every week on the live stream. If you stream on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine tag, as well as the game development tag. Those are two good ones to make sure that you can find others um, that are working on content that you might be interested in. And make sure that you follow us on social media, hit the notification bell on YouTube, and prepare for next week when we're going to have uh, Jeremiah Grant, Aaron Cox, as well as Kieran Ritchie on to talk about motion warping and full body IK. And maybe we'll go ahead and solve the mystery of what happened to the missing motion, uh, slope warping demo that Jeremiah Grant uh, promised <laughs> during the Control Rig live stream Ooh. a couple months ago. I'm just learning about this. Yes. <laughs> That's next week. Make sure you tune in for that. Um, I, I, I've been following along in some of their prep and they're getting uh, ready to show off and break everything down that was happening in the Valley of the Ancient and probably a lot more. I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and prep for a long stream because last time we were hanging out for quite some time. Um, with that said, once again, thank you, Jeff, for coming on and Chance for helping me host the, sh the series here. Um, it's been a pleasure. Anything else you'd like to leave the audience with today? No, I guess use the system and uh, share what to, what you do with it and post on the forums so we can iterate on uh, making the system better. Yeah, um, I'm just glad to be here. Good to see everybody again. It's been what a week now, so yeah. <laughs> and you'll be back next week, or hopefully, I should say. We're 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 planning for you to be back next week. That said, thank you both again, and thank you all out there. Hope you're staying safe. Until next week. Stay safe. Fire one. Bye.